festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh, uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. Welcome back to the second session of the day on behalf of JLF Colorado, Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts and JLF Colorado, the Boulder Public Library and the City of Boulder, welcome you back to this session, The Black Wave, Kim Katas in conversation with Navdeep Suri. With extraordinary detail and intricacy, Kim Katas' book, Black Wave, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the 40-year rivalry that unraveled culture, religion, and collective memory in the Middle East is a gripping narrative weaving together history, geopolitics, and culture to present a comprehensive analysis of the Middle East. In conversation with diplomat Navdeep Suri, Katar unfolds a fascinating cast of characters whose lives were severely impacted by the geopolitics contours of the region. Kim Ghattas is a journalist, author, and analyst with more than 20 years of experience in print and broadcast media, covering the Middle East, international affairs, and the United States foreign policy. She has reported for the BBC, the Financial Times, and the Waltz Grant. She's also the author of Black Wave, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the 40-year rivalry that unraveled culture, religion, and collective memory in the Middle East. She serves on the Board of Trustees of the American University of Beirut and the Board of Directors for Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. Ambassador Navdeep Suri has served as India's ambassador to the UAE, High Commissioner to Australia, Ambassador to Egypt, and Consul General in Johannesburg. He's also held diplomatic assignments in Tanzania, the United Kingdom, the United States, and has headed the Africa and Public Diplomacy Departments of the India's Ministry of External Affairs. After acclaimed translations of his grandfather, Nanak Singh's novels, Pavitra Papi as the watchmaker and Ad Khiriya Pool as a life incomplete, he has worked on Khuni Vaisakhi, a long dirge written by Nanak Singh in 1920 after surviving the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Do remember all our sessions are available to view on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jeffrey Lit Fest JLF. And in case any of you drop off, remember, all you need to do is log on to any of these. And should we drop off, just hang in there and we'll be right back. Also remember to stay tuned to the jlflitfest.org backslash Colorado for the full schedule and information about our speakers and programs. And remember, from Boulder, Colorado, we then move on to Houston, New York, and Toronto, all in November. 
As you all know, these are difficult times and we at Teamwork and JLF, we struggle to bring you JLF Colorado without charging any registration fee. Please do consider donating as generously as you can to help JLF in Colorado to ensure a free, seamless and continuous flow of knowledge between people and between countries and continents. Ladies and gentlemen, the Black Weave. Kim Hadas in conversation with Ambassador Navdeep Suri. Ambassador Suri, Kim, over to both of you. Kim. A very warm welcome to GLF Colorado. And I have to say how much I enjoyed reading your book uh, and what an important contribution uh, you've made to a broader understanding uh, of the region. Um, I would take some uh, pride that I've spent a number of years in the region, uh, but there, the way that you've managed to connect so many disparate uh, uh, threads uh, into this uh, narrative is really, really quite remarkable. And, uh, you know, as I finished, um, I had to go back to the uh, first page and start with this very um, raw question that you pose in the first line. What happened to us? Uh, and and it, it seems to come from somewhere deep within uh, the author uh, as you, uh, you, you survey the landscape uh, around you. So tell us a little bit uh, what got you to write this book and this inquiry into uh, what happened to us. Sure. First, let me just say uh, thank you for having me uh, participate in, in the festivals. Thank you to the organizers, to William Dalrymple, to Sandroy. And I'm so delighted to be in this conversation with you, Ambassador Suri, because you know the region and uh, without revealing too much about how much you know and the conversations we've had before uh, doing this session, I'm really delighted about um, the perspective that you bring uh, as well to this conversation because of the time that you spent in the region. Um, the question that I ask at the beginning of, of the book, what happened to us, is one that haunts a lot of us in the region. Because when we look to the past and to the lives that our parents have, when our own parents uh, look to um, their younger years, uh, when the younger generations today uh, look at even my life or the life of their grandparents, they can see that there's been an incredible change, a transformation that um, has swept across the region and which makes people feel today that they're living in almost a different country, that the past is truly a foreign country. And these changes are cultural, they're social, they're religious, they're about our collective identity, they're about how we relate to each other. Um, and it's a question that is recurrent and that's why I start the book with it. These social cultural changes are a result of one pivotal year that brought about a lot of geopolitical changes. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a moment. But it's very rare, I think, for a big geopolitical event or a series of geopolitical events to also usher in this wave of cultural and social changes. And that's why I chose to focus the book on that one year, 1979 which was not just a geopolitical turning point, but a turning point that changed so much. And at first, it wasn't necessarily apparent to people what was really changing and to what extent it was permanent. It's a little bit the sort of the boiling frog syndrome. Small shifts around you, changes in people's norms and values. And then 10, 15, 20 years later, you look back and you think, wow, um, things are very different. Um, you know, some of these changes are very visible. The spread of uh, the veil for women, which was not as prevalent before. The rise of uh, religious parties. Uh, the disappearance of certain forms of entertainment. Um, more segregation between men and women. Um, a lot of that is visible, but a lot of it is a, a bit more intangible. Some of it has to do with intolerance, whether it's religious or other. And I think, um, Navdeep, that today the question what happened to us 
is a question that resonates beyond the region. And when I look at the United States today, and I look at the deep polarization in America, I look at how the results of the election have been welcomed by some and rejected by others. When you look at um, the violence in the language that people are using against each other, when you look at the rise of the far right and the far left and the appearance of militias, quest that, that question, what happened to us, is a question that Americans are asking themselves um, as well. So it's a question of our age. That's fascinating because, you know, we've just uh, had the U.S. elections and uh, there were talks of the red wave and of the blue wave. And, uh, you know, you force us to think about the blackness of the wave as perhaps a, a metaphor uh, for uh, something which is uh, deeper. Um, here in India, of course, uh, we talk of uh, sometimes a saffron wave. Uh, and and uh, uh, I guess uh, we would want to not be asking uh, this question a decade or two later, uh, which mm. intellectuals today uh, worry about, uh, that would we be looking back and saying what happened to us? Um, and, and that's a, a thought that does remain in, in people's minds. But, uh, you know, uh, you've covered um, Saudi Arabia and Iran in specific detail, but a lot of uh, granular, granularity on, on, on Egypt and on Pakistan uh, as well. Um, the fact of 1979 as the trigger, uh, and, and, and you, know, you force us as readers to uh, connect those dots of the revolution of 79 in Iran, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, uh, what was happening in Egypt. Um, tell us in a little bit more detail uh, how you ended up bringing these threads together. Why did 79 for you uh, stand out the way it did? That question, what happened to us, as I was trying to understand what had brought about these, these changes around us, why were we living? with so much intolerance, extremism? Um, why were we living in what was uh, once a vibrant, tolerant, diverse region? Why did it now feel like it was closed in and, and, and dark? Why was there this darkness of the mind, the closing of, of the minds of people um, in this region? And I don't want to generalize because what I do also in the book is show that um, there are a lot of people who fought back against that uh, black wave and some of them gave, gave their life uh, in pushing back against the darkness and, and the intolerance. But what, what really changed things, and I kept coming back to the same year, is that year, 1979. Because 1979 brought together several events which on the face of it look completely separate, and they were separate, but they become inextricably linked. The Iranian revolution, with a return to uh, Iran from exile of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that same year in December, and in, in between the two, sandwiched between the two, is the siege of Mecca in Saudi Arabia by Saudi zealots. These three events unleash several trends. One of them, is Iran and Saudi Arabia from being um, friendly rivals, friendly competitors in the region, twin pillars in US policy, uh, become rivals. Previously, before 1979, Iran, a Shia country, and Saudi Arabia, a Sunni country, were perfectly happy being on good terms, cooperating, they had their divergences, as do you know, many countries, but they dealt with it at a state level. But after 1979 and the return of Ruhollah Khomeini, he had grand ambitions, grand designs beyond Iran and beyond even the world of the Shia community. He wanted to be a leader of the Muslim world as a whole. And the Saudis started to realize after initially welcoming him and welcoming an Islamic revolution, they started to realize that their friend the Shah had been replaced not by someone just as friendly, but by somebody who had ambitions that could undermine Saudi Arabia's own role 
in the Muslim world. And then the Saudis are challenged within their own territory by these Saudi zealots who feel that the Saudi uh, royals, the House of Saud, is not religious enough. And the Saudis, instead of stamping out this zealotry and pushing back, they give in to it. They, in essence, hand the keys of the kingdom to the clerical establishment because they've seen what happened to the Shah and what happened and, and how the clerical establishment challenged him and brought him down. And then you have the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which is a way for the Saudis to um, reburnish their credentials by fighting the good war against um, the disbelievers. They send uh, money, they send men to fight that war. And the combination of these three events becomes toxic. The Iranians were trying to export their own version of Islam and Shiism. The Saudis who feel challenged within their own country clamp down further, become even more conservative and feel they also have to export their version of ultra-Orthodox, puritanical, literalist Islam to the rest of the Muslim world to challenge the Iranian agenda. And then on the ground in Afghanistan, that becomes combined with the power of the weapon, the gun, something that Islamists discover for the first time. And they then come back home after fighting the Soviets, drunk on power and feeling like they can change their own countries. And we see what happens um, in the 90s. And so 1979 is really a watershed year. But as I said, it's not just about the geopolitics. It's not just about Iran and Saudi Arabia becoming enemies, but about using the soft power tools of culture uh, and social education and education uh, and religious education to, to challenge each, each other. And in doing that, they change the societies around them. And that's where we are today. Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, when you spend some time in the region, one of the things that you uh, learn very quickly is that when in doubt, blame the Americans. Um, and and, and uh, if you can't deal with the problems uh, that uh, somehow are uh, existing in your society, again, find for uh, a foreign hand that can be uh, held responsible. Uh, but, you know, the Americans did have their share of blame in terms of the support that they gave to a series of authoritarian regimes, uh, be it in Syria, uh, in Egypt or elsewhere. Um, and, and one of the things that we saw in Egypt, for example, by first by Nasser and then by Sadat and then by Mubarak is a deliberate effort to shut out the uh, legitimate opposition parties. Um, many people forget that Egypt was actually a bit of a democracy in the 1930s with the al waft party and they had an elected prime minister through multi-party elections. Uh, but once you've shut out the leftists and the communists and the intellectuals and, and, and you put them all in jail because they are seen as the serious intellectual dissent, the only space that's left over is for the Islamists. Uh, and, 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 and so when we were looking at the... Uh, post-Arab Spring elections uh, amongst us diplomats, for example, there was hardly any doubt that the Muslim Brotherhood would win any uh, reasonably free and fair elections because who else was there if you took the generals out of the, uh, out, out of the equation? So I think there is that aspect of, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, and it's a point that you make uh, beautifully that, you know, the, the choice at some level is authoritarianism or Islam, or is it an Islamist authoritarianism, which you're seeing in some uh, so, some parts of the world, Iran being a case in point? So um, I, I would say, Navdeep, that uh, you raise a couple of very interesting points. First of all, certainly uh, in my book, I don't intend to absolve the Americans of any responsibility for the role they play in shaping events in the region, because they do, of course, play a role. Uh, from their support for dictators to the invasion of Iraq, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot there. But what I wanted to do is really um, shed more light on the role that local actors have and big actors. I mean, Saudi Arabia and Iran are big, powerful countries, and they're not victims. They are actors. They're agents. They are they are agents of change themselves. They are big players on the chessboard. Now, Saudi Arabia is an ally of the US. Iran, you could say, is a victim of a lot of American foreign policy with sanctions, with um, you know, embargoes, et cetera, et cetera.
but it has also a very powerful role that it plays um, in the region by deploying asymmetrical warfare, militias, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they, they, they are uh, players uh, and it's important to shed light on the responsibility of these two countries uh, in shaping the region that we have um, today. Now, when it comes to uh, the rise of political Islam, you're absolutely right that what um, leaders like Anwar Sadat did is they were so worried about the challenge posed to them by the left, the intellectuals, the intelligentsia, that they used what they thought at the time was um, you know, a minor uh, element in society, which were the budding Islamists at the time, they used that, including Salafists in Egypt, to push back against um, the left and the intelligentsia, etc. And you know, they jailed leftists and intellectuals, etc. Because at the time, the threat was still seen as um, the left, the communists, the Soviets, and whoever could bring those ideas to your, your country was a potential threat. And the idea of political Islam as a real player wasn't there yet. It wasn't seen either as a, as a potential force, a real one. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, was very active in Egypt, but it had also been crushed by Abdel Nasser. Um, and so Anwar Sadat played with fire in a way, and he allowed something within his own country to be unleashed that they could later could not control. And you could say the same for many of the dictators in the region, whether they're pro-American or not, they end up using the threat of political Islam to tell the West, it's either us or the radicals. But I disagree that it's a binary choice. There's still a lot in between those two. It doesn't have to be the tyrant or the terrorist. There's a lot in between. Um, we just need to give a voice to it. And that's what I try to do with the characters that I profile in the book. And I was going to uh, come to the characters because I think what really gives texture to the stories that you narrate are the characters. Uh, uh, but I'll take the liberty of uh, uh, recalling two from my own assignments in Egypt, uh, because you've got two lovely characters, Nasser Abu Zayed and Ittihar, uh, and, and of course, several other Egyptians. Uh, you know, I, I served twice in Egypt with a gap of about 25 years in between. Uh, I was there from 84 to 87 uh, as my first overseas assignment. And then I went back 25 years later in 2012 uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring as ambassador. Uh, and so, it, yeah, so, so, so uh, it, during my first assignment, we lived in a small apartment in Mohandasin and our landlady um, was um, uh, a brilliant woman who spoke um, in fluent French and uh, um, English and Arabic, of course. Uh, she worked in a foreign diplomatic mission uh, with the ambassador, uh, used to entertain very well, and we used to enjoy their company. Um, 2012, I went back to them and wanted to reestablish contact with them. Um, I found that the lady who used to wear the most chic dresses was now a very conservative person in a hijab um, and an abaya, um, and was distinctly uncomfortable striking any conversation with me uh, mm -hmm. at a time when her husband was not at home. The second character during our 2012 assignment was uh, a socialite who lived fairly close to our place. Um, you could have a glass of wine with her and, uh, 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 you know, uh, and, and, and certainly there was this feeling of projection that these are the liberal elites mm. of the Egyptian society. And then you had this massacre on the 14th of August, uh, uh, 2013, when in a day, a thousand people uh, of Muslim Brotherhood supporters were killed in the yeah, middle of Rabbah. Uh, in Rabbah. And, uh, uh, and there wasn't any compassion that you could see in the uh, liberal elites. Uh, and it forced you to question, what is liberal? Is it somebody who looks like us, talks like us, or is it somebody who actually empathizes and is willing to concede space to the other ideology? And in a sense, you know, uh, these are two of the characters that I encountered, and I'm sure we could talk all evening about these, but 
Tell me, how did you come across characters like Nasser Abu Zaid and uh, Ittihar? I, I want to just comment briefly uh, first on what you said, Nabdi, because it's such an interesting observation. First, about uh, the lady who um, turned conservative. I think it's very important to make clear that we're not making a judgment on people's life choices, um, their embrace of religion. Um, I think that what we're remarking on in this region is that often um, it becomes an imposition and it becomes a lack of choice. And so I try to highlight also uh, around me those who are very conservative and some of the characters in my book are conservative. They pray, they fast, one of them is veiled. Uh, but they believe in choice, freedom of choice for everyone. So if they are veiled, they want their you know, fellow countrywomen to have the choice to veil or not to veil. This is really the core of what we're discussing. It's the freedom of choice, that it doesn't have to become this blanket decision, this blanket sort of social dictum. This is how you behave. And then on the other point of, you know, what is really a, a, a liberal, uh, you know, you can be a social, uh, cultural, um, um, you know, a bon vivant, but have very um, conservative ideas in politics. And, and we see that, um, you know, to some extent with what the Saudis are trying to do. They're allowing today, Hamad bin Salman is allowing uh, women to drive, cinemas, music, DJs, the circus, jazz, all of that. But is it become a liberal democracy? It's not even become a liberal monarchy, if, if that word exists. Politically, it's still unforgiving. And going to, um, to address the, your question about my, my characters, you know, uh, I love all the characters um, in, in the book. And I came across Nasser Abu Zaid's story um, because I actually first came across Ibtihal Yunus uh, and her, um, um, you know, life story as a French literature professor who was married to this um, Egyptian intellectual and how they were exiled in the Netherlands, which is my other home country. And there was... Um, a deeply conservative, secular Muslim thinker. And I know some people will say, what do you mean deeply conservative, but secular? Yes, deeply conservative in his own life choices, but secular in how he sees politics. And um, this is the kind of man we really need today to have conversations about modernity and Islam. Uh, and in the 90s, as political Islam started to feel more empowered in the years after the war in Afghanistan, violence started be to become more, uh, more common in, in, in the country and as a tool of the, of the Islamists. And attacks against liberal thinkers and secular Muslim thinkers became the norm. And Nasser Abu Zaid was pushed and pushed and uh, declared an apostate. And then they were told he and Ibtihal that they had to divorce because she could not, as a Muslim, continue to be married to an infidel, um, and they chose exile. Um, but another thinker in Egypt, <laughs> Farak, <laughs> uh, Farak <laughs> was uh, shot and assassinated for what he had <laughs> expressed as uh, secular thinking, secular Muslim thinking, and daring to debate um, the idea of a civil state in Egypt. And you'll have to excuse uh, my dog who just uh, made a quick hello to our audiences <laughs> everywhere. Um, coming to the way the trends are shaping up in the region today, uh, and if we fast forward, so in 79 and right through the 80s and 90s, and even the first decade of the 20th uh, century to a certain extent, you had a competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran each supporting their own uh, acolytes uh, to, to demonstrate that, you know, the Iranians were creating what the Gulf uh, monarchs like to call a Shia crescent that moves all the way from Iran into Bahrain and parts of Saudi Arabia and Iraq uh, in, and Syria into Lebanon. 
uh, and and create this feeling of uh, encirclement in some of the uh, regimes in that uh, that part of the world. Um, the Saudis uh, were uh, probably supporting the worst kind of uh, uh, madrasas and uh, uh, the uh, Taliban and others uh, throughout that that period. Um, in a sense, for what I've learned from some of my conversations. 9-11 was the first shock uh, in, the, in, in the Gulf. And, uh, um, you know, I've heard members of the royal families say that it forced them to rethink uh, how could this happen to our people in our society and what's going on. And I know that in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, for instance, the um, leadership took a very, very clear position of almost a zero tolerance towards religious extremism. So even while the society politically, as you said, uh, remains uh, authoritarian or illiberal, uh, but at least in terms of uh, uh, the uh, religious, personal religious choices, uh, the latitude for personal freedoms has been progressively uh, increased. Uh, and in a sense, the UAE was trying to tell the Saudis that look, the heavens don't fall if women drive or if you have a music concert or, or something. And, and it is quite striking to see the Emiratis um, um, agree to a Hindu temple in Abu Dhabi uh, and a grand one at that, uh, which even 10 years back would have been unthinkable. And, and, and there was a, 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 an opposition from the clergy or sections of the clergy, but it was stamped yeah. down quite uh, uh, effectively. Um, you are talking about a house of Abrahamic religions with a synagogue, a mosque, and a church in the same complex. And yet, at the same time, when you've got some of these trends happening in Bahrain, in, in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, towards at least allowing more freedom of religious expression, if nothing else, you have a different trend in Turkey and in Pakistan. Uh, and, 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 you know, I... Uh, I wonder what your character Mehtab Chana would uh, think uh, about Imran Khan, who had quite a reputation as a playboy, today uh, putting himself at the vanguard of a, a religious revival and, and, and making common cause purely on, 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 a, on religious issues uh, with Turkey. And Turkey itself, I mean, Kamal Atatürk must be turning in his grave uh, to, to see uh, Aragan uh, shaping a very different um, uh, trend for the country. So I guess the whole, you know, are you saying, seeing a phenomenon where the black wave is receding in some areas and yet manifesting itself in others? Mm. So I think in many ways, yes, the black wave is receding overall because the young generation does not want to live with the darkness that their parents had to um, endure. And they resent their parents in many cases for having allowed it to unfold like this. And I, I end the book with this question that Saudis and Iranians are asking of their parents. How could you let this happen? How could you replace the Shah with something even worse? Look where we are today. And in Saudi Arabia, the question is, how did you not see that the House of Saud, that the royal family was giving the clerics this carte blanche to transform our lives into this dark country. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, having always been conservative, became even more um, conservative. And yes, today, uh, the younger generation wants a different life. But also, in Saudi Arabia and in Iran, they have very well understood the leadership that religion is no longer a useful tool to, in a way, rally the masses. People have moved on. And so today the motto or you know, the, the game in, in town is uh, nationalism, patriotism. And that, again, is, of course, what we're seeing um, around the world, this you know, populist nationalism, which the Saudis and the Iranians are, are using. And in reverse, you have countries like Turkey, where they had um, state secularism for so long that someone like Erdogan has been able to play on the way that some people felt under this secular rule and uh, whip up 
um, you know, religious sentiments and religious uh, desires and religious feelings to, um, you know, increase his popularity and his grip on, on power. But overall, I think the black wave, if we define it as I define it in the book, this sort of spread of intolerance and religious intolerance and uh, the of culture, the of culture, I think that is um, receding. But that's not to say that the problems don't remain because the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran is still there. Uh, Turkey, as you mentioned, is becoming a very active player again and, and again. And I do want to caution just a little bit about the cosmetic changes that some of the rulers in this region are, are making. Uh, I do think it's great progress that you have uh, freedom of religion today, to some extent, in the UAE, uh, but it's not enough. There needs to be a reckoning or there needs to be a more, a more opening in freedom of expression, in political freedoms, because otherwise it's not sustainable, I don't think. And similar in Saudi Arabia, uh, the music, uh, the jazz concerts, the cinemas, it's all good. And it was important because young Saudis were bored. And when you have bored young people, um, they join gangs. And sometimes they're gangs in Mexico and sometimes they're religious extremist gangs um, in, in, in the region. And that's how I see it. It's, you know, what do you do with yourself? How do you fit in? And let's grab a gun and let's, you know, go exert some, some violence. But Saudi Arabia has a lot of work to do when it comes to promoting worldwide a more tolerant message. They are the custodians of the two holy sites. They are, they want to be the leaders of a billion Muslims. And so aside from the work they're doing within their country, there is still a lot of work to do when it comes to what is the message that they put out through Mecca, through their religious institutions, to the outside world. And it's going to be very difficult to roll back what they spread across the, across the region, across the Muslim world. Because the difference between Iran and Saudi Arabia is that everything that Iran puts out is state-led. And Iran, Iranian leadership has the capability of calling it back in to some extent. It is state-directed by the supreme leader. The way Saudi Arabia approaches its influence is it throws ideas to the wind and it sees where it lands and none of it is state directed and none of it is state funded. And these things then produce, you know, offshoots. So ISIS is not a product of Saudi Arabia, but it's a byproduct of Saudi funding for certain schools of thought and mosques and madrasas, etc. And I think that's going to be hard to roll back. And I think, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a sense, that's why it's important to recognize the changes that are taking place uh, because yes. the same authoritarianism in, on the political side is being used now to rein in the uh, mullahs who'd gone too far on the religious side. Whether it is yeah. the there might be a backlash there. Uh, or, or the religious police, uh, there is now a very strict control in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in UAE, on who says what in the Friday sermons. Uh, nobody has a, a can freelance anymore. Uh, so the power of the pulpit, uh, if you will, is being withdrawn by the state uh, yep. to, to, to standardize the message. And, 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 you know, this wouldn't happen in a democracy, but uh, at least, uh, you know, authoritarianism is being put to some use. <laughs> Uh, but I worry, I worry about the backlash, uh, Navdeep. I worry about these preachers who are in jail or who are being silenced. On the one hand, you don't want them spouting their venom. On the other hand, um, when you clamp down on something, it has a way of finding its way, its way out. And I worry also about this westernization of Saudi society with the way that Hamad bin Salman is approaching the opening up of the kingdom. You know, a lot of similarities can be drawn with how the Shah tried to impose this model of modernization and westernization on Iran. The backlash was, was big. The clerical establishment eventually fought back. Now, perhaps Mohammed bin Salman is authoritarian enough that he can, you know, escape that. But it is not, um, 
you know, it is not necessarily sustainable and there are, there are dangers um, there. There is so much more that, you know, um, I wanted to explore in, in the book, so many nuances, and you bring up Turkey. And of course, Turkey doesn't really feature in, uh, in the book except, you know, just in, in passing because it's, you know, it's already a, a trip through uh, 40 years and seven countries and 15 characters. It's a little bit like a, you know, um, 1001 night of Middle Eastern geopolitics. But sometimes when I have these conversations, I think, gosh, I think, I think there's another book there. Yeah, and, 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 and for me, the big enigma uh, will remain Egypt because uh, they've done that circle uh, and they're back to authoritarian rule uh, 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 by a leader who uh, is probably even more uh, rigid in some ways in imposing uh, his authoritarianism. There is very little room for dissent. Young people are again voting with their feet and leaving the, 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 the country. Um, and, uh, you know, is this sustainable? Where does it take the largest country, the most, uh, in a sense, influential country in the, in, in the region? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, that remains a question uh, for me to, and you to look at. But we have some interesting questions uh, that have come yeah. from the audience, and I just wanted to uh, take one or two. Um, there's a question from um, uh, Ria. You tell many of these stories through the eyes of a myriad individual men and often women who spoke out in one way or another against the post-79 conservative turn in the region. I quote, all progressive thinkers who represent vibrant pluralistic word that persists beneath the black wave. When will this black wave lift and how? Mm. So as we were just saying, I think it's a great question. I think that already we're seeing around us efforts by the young generation to push back against this black wave. Uh, when you look at the protests in Lebanon over the last year, you look at the protests in Iraq also since October of last year, pushing back against sectarianism, against the role of um, militias, of um, you know, religion to some extent. Uh, when you look at the uh, protests that have taken place repeatedly, in Iran over time, you realize that something is afoot. And then look at Sudan. Look at what Sudan achieved. It's an incredible story. 30 years of dictatorship are over. Um, and they have changed so many of their laws and opened up in so many ways already um, that it's quite remarkable. It can be done. And I do believe that it can be done um, in a slow, methodical way by the people. Sometimes with a bit of outside help when it comes to justice. Um, you know, the ICC uh, ruling on Omar Bashir played a role. Um, I think there was a sense that um, a lot of different pieces of the puzzle had to come together, but they did it. And I think across this region, there is also a sense that we can do it. It's hard because there isn't really a political culture. Opposition has always been on the outside, um, civil society, NGOs, because politics was left to you know, the sons of, the, 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 the friends of, um, you know, the dictators, the, 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 the mafiosi, et cetera, et cetera. And so the good people didn't want to get involved in, in politics. And so they were always on the outside in civil society, wherever that was even allowed, or in NGOs. And I think slowly there's a realization that if you want to change the system, you have to participate in politics. And so I think that's what we're seeing now, that this younger generation think, okay, how, how do we do that? How do we campaign? How do we poll? How do we canvas? How do we write a platform? How do we write a campaign program? Uh, it's going to take time, uh, but I never give up hope. Well, you, and we shouldn't. And, and you know, um, uh, one of the interesting things about the uh, Tahrir Square uh, protests in Cairo uh, in uh, 2011 uh, were that some of the young protesters were carrying uh, posters which had quotes from Mahatma Gandhi. Um, yeah. And the April 6th movement in particular uh, had this big banner in their office uh, uh, from Gandhi. And um, so we did a little contest um, uh, inviting young people to design posters using some of Gandhi's sayings. 
And the results that we got were stunning. I mean, it was uh, like peaceful revolution expressed through Gandhi's uh, 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 eyes. Or and that revolution, I'll never forget traveling to Cairo soon after uh, Mubarak uh, was removed. And I was at the time working for the BBC. Uh, I was covering the State Department. So I used to travel with secretaries of state. And I traveled to Egypt in early March with Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton met with the activists of the revolution, including from the April 6 movement. And she asked them, how are you organizing for the elections? And one of them answered, we don't do politics, we do revolution. Yeah. And of course, then the elections happened and you know, independent candidates and the revolutionaries got nothing and the spoils were divided between the establishment, the army and the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think a lesson was learned. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a question from Sarah. Um, your progressive heroes represent the silenced majority. They are the past and the future. Yet most have ended up killed or in exile. So where are the future heroes? Will they continue to be silenced? I use that a term silenced uh, majority because one of my characters, Yasir Haj Saleh from Syria, an incredible intellectual activist and uh, candid speaker, uh, remarked on the fact that I had initially written silent majority. And he said, I don't think we are silent. I think we keep being silenced. We keep being um, beaten up, but we're not silent. We keep trying to speak out. And it's true that, as Sarah says, a lot of my characters end up in exile or unfortunately um, get killed. But because they're characters, um, in a way, I mean, when you write a book, if I were choosing uh, to tell the story through the lives of people um, who did not have some uh, drama, let's say, in, in their life, the narrative would not be as striking for a reader. So I certainly don't want her to think that all uh, progressive thinkers end up in exile or, or killed, far from it. Um, I use these characters to tell a vivid story, but there are so many people uh, like them across this region who continue to fight this, this fight for freedom of choice, for progressive centrist values, um, for uh, you know, tolerance. And I think they're there around us. I mean, they're there on the streets of Beirut during the protests in northern Lebanon, in Tripoli. They're there in Baghdad, in Najaf, in Basra. Um, they're there in, in, in Pakistan. Everyone's doing um, their bit. And sometimes it's hard to see how much is happening uh, because the headlines are always dominated by the terrorists and the tyrants. And that's why I wanted to give a voice through to these people through my book. Um, I could go on, but um, I believe we are running uh, against the clock. Uh, so I just want to say, um, bring out the next book. Um, I hope everybody gets to read the Black I'm, 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 uh, I'm open to suggestions. Send in your letters. <laughs> and, 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 I have uh, a lot of ideas. I can't yeah. make up my I just hope everybody gets a chance to read this wonderful book. And I'm, I can promise you one thing. It will make you see the Middle East differently. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much for this really wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you, Kim and Navdeep. That really unpacked a huge, incredible amount of information and, and, and a perspective that perhaps many of us are unaware of, especially what you said about 1979 being that sort of watershed year when everything came together and uh, amazing. And, and you can order the book online, as all of you know, from the Boulder Bookstore. Uh, or you can go to Full Circle in India, uh, or of course it's available on Amazon. So please do book uh, your, your copy of, of this incredible book. And, and Kim, as you said during the conversation, that could well be the next part of your book. I hope it is because there's so much more I think we need to understand. Ambassador Suri, I hope you also collaborate in your understanding, which is a completely different perspective from the inside because you have seen these regimes change. Uh, fascinating conversation. Thank you both again. Uh, for so being part of uh, JLF Boulder. For those of you who enjoyed this uh, conversation and it truly was 
really packed with knowledge and information. Again, a, a reminder to buy the books of our speakers available through the Boulder Bookstore uh, in the USA and Full Circle in India. Uh, once again, thank you to all our official partners and do log back on for our next session, The Word and the Voice. Ramon Del Castillo, uh, Natalie Handel, Janice Pariyat and Melissa Rani tell Sati Selva uh, introduced by me. And this is at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 9 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time and 8.30 a.m. Uh, Indian Standard Time. Uh, as you all know, the 2020 edition of GLF North America features Nobel laureates, Man Booker and Pulitzer Prize winners, including Eric Cornell, Michael Sandel, William Caleb McDaniel, Vijay Shashadri, Stephen Greenblatt, and so many more to discuss issues, including, as we just heard, the Middle East, the American elections, Black Lives Matter, environment, history, science, travel, nation, and identity, fiction, and poetry. And now we present a reading of Sanchita Gupta from the Jaipur Writer short series. Enjoy and see you back at the next session. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sanjita Gupta, and I'm going to be reciting my poem, A Tale of Three Words, which has been inspired by the current events in the world and in our country. It's also an extension of my experience working as an intern during these times. A Tale of Three Words You murdered her, he screamed, while I looked away in disbelief, wondering if it will ever be alright, but I know I would never be of any relief. A Tale of Three Words is what I will recount, remains etched in my mind. Here's how the events unwound. I belonged to a regiment, a recruit like many, received their training wheels just a few months previously. There was an air of expectancy. Anticipation ran through our bones. This wasn't a long time ago, just oblivious to the impending doom. As the streets bore a deserted look, the battleground was the hospital floor. Young and naive were our hearts, but spirit full of hope. We heard the numbers of fallen rise every morning on the news. They devised a contingency plan and us we had not a clue. Where to go, what to do. Our knowledge wasn't scarce, but the fear of the known was taking a toll on us. The commanders took charge. They were on the battleground as we looked up to them and saw them bear the brunt. Protective layer suffocates, a mere breath, hot find. You complain about four walls while they fought for life. Not just for others, but theirs too. The killer didn't spare them, you see, the humans do. Hooked onto wires, a cacophony would pulsate, waiting in hopeful peace as it disappointingly fades. Tired of work, they were not. Tired of loss in their mind. Drained the sweat and blood as you clap for them to shine. As a trainee, I witnessed it all. The agony that encapsulated both the soldiers and the victims, while their kin just faded. Unaware of the duel of life and death their beloved was in, calling on their gods to work a miracle. Inhaling the luminous elixir to keep darkness at bay, exhaustion hovered over them as obscurity slowly crept its way. You murdered her, he cried. The mother of his newborn was gone. Left for her perpetual journey, the man felt he was robbed. Transcended from reality, he bellowed in pain. Accused the saviors for playing this game. As I, though, as I saw the widower shatter into pieces, I knew I would never be of any relief, for I was the one that told him about his eternal grief. I recount this moment each time when I have to break the news. It doesn't fall to me like it did that day, because this time I felt the pain too. It is an ongoing battle that cannot be won by wizardry. You and I have to fight, not to be silent witnesses, one of the greatest tragedies in history. Festival, a living library. 
or perhaps even a library of life to join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science of the joys of poetry and music the consolations of philosophy the sense of literature and of life about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. Work Arts, bringing India to the world and the world to India through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Team Work Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers, and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, have taken the flavor of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia, and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalautsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. 
The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavor by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities, featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer singer Jameson Ross, and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theater through the Mahindra Excellence in Theater Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theater industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the Multi-City Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information Visit www.teamworkarts.com